your candidate for Holland Bukit Timah, GRC, Michelle Lee. Michelle 小姐，她将会是荷兰五级芝麻 B 选区的候选人。Dear fellow Singaporeans, thank you for coming to hear us speak today. Many of you may have read in the latest news today that Mr. Osama bin Laden is dead. The passing of Mr. bin Laden marks the end of an era, an era of terror, fear, worry, and anxiety that has dominated our lives since 2001. For us too, in the past 10 years, too many Singaporeans have lived with too much stress, too many worries, and too many fears. Now, it is election time, and still, we find ourselves mired in fear. Fear that if we vote opposition, our constituency will not be well managed. Fear that the PAP will somehow punish us for voting opposition. I too have confessed to you my fears. Fears for the future stability and integrity of our nation. Fear that the PAP is given an absolute mandate on May 7th. Fear of losing the Singapore we know and love. I want to address some of the fears I have been hearing about. Oftentimes, fears are diminished when looked at in the light of objective fact. With that in mind, I hope I can help you put some of these unwarranted fears to rest. First, Singapore will not collapse if opposition is in Parliament. You may have read that Al Junid is the only election hotspot. Let us, with optimism, assume opposition wins two GRCs and two SMCs. Even at that point, opposition would form only a small minority in Parliament. This minority will be meaningful enough so that Singaporeans will have a voice in Parliament as a check on the ruling party. It is inconceivable, however, that such a minority opposition could cause any instability in our system. Secondly, Singapore will not become a mud swamp or third world nation if we have opposition in parliament. Our women will not become maids in other people's countries. In the 1930s or earlier, Singapore was already the jewel of the British Empire in Southeast Asia. Singapore's greatest natural resource has always been its location and its people. Singaporeans are well-educated, creative, and fundamentally entrepreneurial, the descendants of pioneering migrants. We will survive and prosper and we will be happier in doing so. We need a government who appreciates and encourages Singaporeans' natural creativity and entrepreneurship. Thirdly, your vote is secret and there are checks and balances to ensure this. Representatives from both the parties will be present at balloting and counting to ensure the secrecy of your vote. We, the candidates, will also be present at the vote counting process. After counting, the votes are sealed in boxes and stored at the Supreme Court. If there are no disputes, six months later, as Dr. Ang told you, the sealed boxes are incinerated in the presence of both the winning and losing candidates. Franklin Roosevelt once said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself because fear numbs the mind and robs the soul. Fear prevents us from holding our heads high and doing what is right. In fear, we make choices 
that we know to be wrong. Fear stops us from dreaming and hoping for a better future. So today, let us move beyond the fear and imagine a future for our Singapore filled with purpose and hope. A future that will anchor our young to the nation. A future that will value and cherish every individual Singaporean. Friends, with the passing of Mr. Bin Laden, let us put a decade of fearfulness and terror behind us for good. All over the world, the winds of change are blowing. These winds are blowing out fear and bringing hope for a better future. The world is moving on. Let us not be left behind. It is time to take a deep breath, put fear behind us, hold our heads high, and move ahead to a brighter future. We do this with the certainty that if we work together as a nation, as a people, the future will only get better for all Singaporeans. Those of you who were at our rally yesterday may remember that I spoke about how the quality of life seems to be standing still or even getting worse, even though our GDP keeps on growing. I think a true measure of how good a job our government is doing is how much it has improved the lives of Singaporeans. The quality of our lives depends on many things, including the cost of living, disposable income, the quality of our living environment, education, health care, the maturity of our arts and culture, the kindness and compassion we show to each other, and political freedom. We do not live on bread alone. Remember this when the government next uses upgrading as an incentive and a threat. Of all of these facets of a better quality of life, because of limited time, today I want to touch on healthcare and education. I want to share some surprising information about healthcare in Singapore. This information comes from a 2011 World Bank report that indicates that Singapore's healthcare facilities rank poorly. On some measures, we are worse than several third world countries. Singapore has fewer hospital beds and fewer doctors per capita than China, Russia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Bulgaria, Cuba, Czech Republic. The list goes on. I'm going to stop at C. I think you get the picture. <laughs> According to the same report, as a percentage of total spending on healthcare, only the governments of these countries spend less than our government. Afghanistan, Azerbaijan, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Georgia, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Haiti, India, Laos, Liberia, Myanmar, Sudan, Tajikistan, Togo, Pakistan, Uganda, and Yemen. I want to cry! <laughs> no more tears to cry! This is the kind of company we are keeping when it comes to public spending on health care. With such a dearth of public spending on health care and a shortage of health care facilities, treatment and consultation fees in Singapore have become prohibitively high for many. Waiting times at polyclinics in Singapore are, shall we say, legendary. <laughs> Even former PAP MP and chairman of the feedback unit, Wang Kai-yuan, noted widespread unhappiness 